Thanks very much, Connor. The great Russian Jewish historian Leon Polyakov lived to the age of 87. Um, he devoted over half of those years to researching and writing a monumental five volume history of anti Semitism spanning 2,000 years. When asked why he had spent so much of his life on such a project, he replied, I wanted to find out why certain people have it in for me. <laughs> well, I won't put my humble efforts in the same league as Paul Jacobs, but if you ask me why I decided 13 years ago to begin work on the life of an Irish leader who hadn't had a biography written about him in 80 years, um, I'd have to reply, um, I wanted to find out why so many people had it in for John Redmond. Uh, I hope this book explains not only why Redmond's reputation suffered towards the end of his life and afterwards, but why the reasons for that no longer should apply, and why after a century it is time for a new evaluation of the man. Well, actually, um, it was Kevin Myers, our guest speaker here tonight, who first put me on to all this. Uh, it was when I read a column, uh, an Irishman's diary column of his back in uh, 1996. Um, I first became aware that there hadn't been a biography of Redmond since 1932 and uh, Kevin wrote about um, what he called the calumnious neglect which uh, brought together two, two of the features of uh, the, the remembrance of Redmond over the years. Redmond is known mainly for the, for the events of the last six years of his life, the big events, home rule, etc. But there's a whole decade of his leadership of the Irish Parliamentary Party which has been buried in oblivion. The, the decade 1900 to 1910 was one of substantial achievement for the Irish Party, the Irish Parliamentary Party, in winning, uh, in winning reforming legislation for Ireland. Uh, three of those achievements stand out, and uh, two of them amounted to social revolutions that changed the face of Ireland. The first was the 1903 Land Purchase Act, the Wyndham Act, which was such a success that by 1916, two out of every three farmers in Ireland owned their land helped by finance from the UK Treasury. So this was the dream of Parnell uh, and uh, David and the original Land League brought to realisation the creation of a peasant proprietary. The second great reform of those years was the Labourers Act of 1906, which financed county councils in building cottages all over the country for the agricultural labourers who depended on seasonal work. Uh, now, uh, already by 1906, 17,000 such cottages had been built under a similar act won by Parnell. But the process was slow. The act won by Redmond greatly accelerated the, the process, the, the rate of building. And by 1916, the total number of cottages stood at 43,000. This meant that a quarter of a million people had been taken out of hovels and housed in sanitary and comfortable cottages, each standing on one acre, each with a pink sty, um, a, a grazing for a cow and enough land, enough space to grow a year's food supply. The, the historian Enda McKay has called it nothing short of a social revolution. One of the most notable effects was to practically wipe out the, um, the diseases of typhus and cholera in the Irish countryside. And then the, the, third, of, the third of these achievements was the legislation to, to found the National University of Ireland, which gave Irish Catholics the long university they had long sought um, to conform to their national and religious ethos. Now, in, in the autumn of 1909, um, an old Fenian called Captain Omar Condon, um, the man who had shouted, God save Ireland, in the dock at Manchester in, in 1867, as he was sentenced to death to be later reprieved, he, he visited from the United States to tour Ireland for five weeks. Redmond uh, took him on a tour in his new motor car, um, took him on a tour of uh, battle sites in uh, 1798 battle sites in Wexford. Um, at Killarney, Omar Condon summed up his impressions, his impressions of Ireland. This was, I remember, at the end of that decade, 1909. He said, they had seen with their own eyes the improvements made all over the country and were especially impressed by the restoration of the evicted tenants. He never expected to see that affected without recourse to force. And he was glad and proud to admit that he was mistaken and that the Irish party had been able to achieve results which they, who believed in force, had not been able to accomplish. Now, of course, the picture is not all rosy. The, the Dublin slum tenement problem was a, was a festering sore that was simply too big for the many legislative attempts, the Housing of the Working Classes Acts, to address it 
uh, the, the, the problem was compounded by the lack of industrialization and the, the high unemployment in the south of Ireland. This problem would persist for many decades after the gaining of independence. But, uh, and the, the mortality rates, the infant mortality rates were very high, were scandalously high in those uh, slum tenements. And yet, overall, by 1912, in the mortality figures for all of Ireland were actually equal to the mortality figures for, the, for those of Britain. Um, and infant mortality figures were actually slightly lower in Ireland than in Britain by 1912. So that's in spite of the, the exceptional uh, situation in Dublin, in the inner city. Uh, the reforms won in that decade left nationalist Ireland with, in Redmond's own words, its feet firmly planted in the groundwork and foundation of a free nation. Uh, this makes it all the more astonishing that if we turn to the educational system, the leading cert uh, history syllabus in the unit covering 1870 to 1914 contains no mention of, of the activities in those years of the political party which during all that time had a democratic mandate from the overwhelming majority of Irish nationalists. While Minority movements such as the early Sinn Féin, the female suffrage movement, are included, as of course they should be. And worse still, the three case studies which, uh, on this syllabus, which are supposed to allow students to study a topic in greater depth, jump right over the period. They jump from the GAA in 1891 straight to the lockout of 1913. Not a mention of the decade of reform. So why is such a fertile period in a country's history not considered worthy of study in its schools. Um, could it be that it's because the reforms were won from the United Kingdom Parliament by the elected representatives of Nationalist and Unionist Ireland without the shedding of a single drop of blood? The, the second relevant unit on the syllabus uh, uh, covers the period 1912 to 49, and amazingly, once again, Redmond is not mentioned among the key personalities of this period, although it's absolutely central to everything that happened between 1912 and 1916. And again, the case studies don't allow for any detailed insight into his role. They begin at 1921 with the treaty negotiations. Uh, so once again, he's, it, it looks as if he was not so much written out of Irish history as squeezed out of the Irish historical record. Uh, coming to the last eight years of Redmond's life, 1910 to, 19, to 1918, these were the years that both made him and broke him. As we know, the Third Home Rule Bill was introduced in 1912, anxiously shepherded through uh, the House of Commons in three successive sessions, and um, finally passed the House of Commons in May 1914, and King George signed it on to the statute book in September of that year. Now, this was the goal that had eluded Parnell the goal for which mainstream Irish nationalists have struggled for 40 years. And yet Redmond is often dismissed as a failure. One study of him was included in a 1989 book called Losers in Irish History. And so he was, uh, a failure and a loser. But what did this failure consist in? And what made him a loser? Well, what I hope you get from reading this book is that his failure was integral to his very success as a nationalist leader. It sounds a paradox, but it's the fact that he succeeded where O'Connell and Parnell before him had failed, bringing Irish self-government in, you know, right into the point of you know, right into legislation and close to the point of implementation. It was this that brought him up against a problem that they had not had to confront. The immediate cause of his downfall was his acceptance of partition, however temporary it might be, and whoever reluctant his acceptance of it. But someone had to be the first to accept partition. Those who attacked him for it then had no better plan for averting it. And those who came after him had no realistic plan for undoing it. And so uh, the, the winter of 1913 to 1914 is crucial. This was the moment when Redmond was forced to come to close quarters for the first time with the Ulster Unionist resistance led by Sir Edward Carson uh, to the prospect of being ruled by a Dublin parliament. Now, like most nationalists, Redmond didn't understand Ulster Unionism. He had initially written off uh, the rhetoric of resistance to home rule as bluster. The, the Irish Party's newspaper, the Freemans Journal, coined the mocking term Ulsteria, 
There have been, there have been serious rioting in Belfast in 1886, at the time of the failed first Home Rule Bill, and he expected something similar, but no worse, this time. When Winston Churchill suggested in late 1913 that, that it might be, that, that uh, North East Ulster might have to be excluded from Home Rule in order to avoid civil war, Redmond condemned it as a proposal for, quote, the mutilation of the Irish nation. Now, the, 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 the half million signatures on the Ulster Solemn League and Covenant were a peaceful expression of the Ulster Unionist community's uh, opposition to being ruled by Home Rule. When the government ignored this, the Ulster Volunteer Force was formed and began to win wide popular support. It became a well-drilled and well-armed uh, force. Very late in the day then, uh, in March 1914, Asquith, Asquith's government finally offered a concession to, unionist, to Ulster Unionist feeling. Under this concession, Ulster counties were to be, to be able to, to, to opt out individually by plebiscite for a, a time that, for a time of six years. Redmond very reluctantly agreed to endorse this as the price of peace. Um, it was not enough, of course, for the Unionist leaders who demanded permanent exclusion and a block of six counties to be excluded. Uh, as events developed with the, the, uh, the so-called mutiny at the Curra and the gun running of, at, at Larne, Redmond saw that home rule could not be imposed on an unwilling people except by brute military force. Um, however great his horror at the idea of dividing Ireland, his, his overriding dread was that Irish self-government would be drowned in blood at its birth. By late July, he was preparing to make another concession to abandon the six-year time limit. And he planned to announce this in a Commons debate scheduled for the 30th of July. But unfortunately, that was the day when Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia. That was the end of all debate on, on uh, home rule for the time being. So the issue remained unresolved. When King George signed the Home Rule Act onto the statute book, the exact nature of the future provisions for Ulster were unknown. And every, but every nationalist suspected that the new Irish Parliament would not rule, would not govern the full territory of the island. Now there's a, there's a widespread belief that Redmond's downfall was due to the fact that after the 1916 insurrection, the wave of, feel, of anti-British feeling caused by the executions of the leaders was what did most to sink Redmond's reputation. Nationalist Ireland, so it goes, was immediately um, convulsed by a demand for complete separation from Britain. Um, so this lowered the stock of home rule, and for, then uh, to add to that, Redmond's support for the war, his encouragement of Irish recruiting, jarred with the new mood. But we need to qualify carefully, I think, this, this view of Irish history. These events undoubtedly had a retrospective effect on his reputation, but they were not initially what undid him. We must avoid the mistake of reading history backwards, um, of looking at 1916 through the prism of 1919 or 1921. The fact is that in the summer of 1916, with O'Connell Street lying in rubble, there was no organised political alternative yet to the Parliamentary Party. Sinn Féin was still a, a loose collection of small clubs with neither an organised leadership nor an agreed programme. But there was one issue on which Redmond and the Irish Party were, were vulnerable. This was his, his willingness to concede a form of partition in return for having an agreed implementation of Home Rule. Ironically, it was not Sinn Féin or the Republicans, but a constitutionalist and pro-war newspaper that did most damage to Redmond on the partition issue. This was the Irish Independent, owned by William Martin Murphy, whom you've been hearing a lot about lately in connection with the the lockout of 1913. The Irish Independent was by far the most uh, powerful media organ in Ireland at the time. Its daily circulation was seven times that of the Freeman's Journal, the party paper. And the circulation had doubled between August 1913 and August 1914. It was priced at, at a halfway, half the price of the Freeman. In 1915, it had already run a campaign highly critical of the Irish Party for what it saw as shortcomings in the Home Rule Act. In 
But now in the summer of 1916, it went into overdrive. It launched a crusade against partition in 52 issues. It uh, carried 38 editorials against partition, all carrying Murphy's, uh, the stamp of Murphy's um, authorship, and all accusing Redmond and his party of unforgivable weakness, of uh, even of treason to the Irish nation. Um, all this came just as Redmond, Carson and Lloyd George were engaged in delicate shuttle negotiations aimed at bringing home rule into immediate operation. The deal uh, this time was to be temporary exclusion of six counties, but with the arrangement to be examined again at the end of the war. The initiative failed in late July. We won't go into the reasons why it failed, but Redmond and the party were fatally damaged. They had consented to partition, but they hadn't received the reward. Stephen Gwynne, uh, his first biographer, wrote, that, uh, wrote later uh, that day, that's the 24th of July, 1916, really finished the Constitutional Party and overthrew Redmond's power. We, we can see an example a few months later in a small, uh, um, in a, a Midland uh, local newspaper called Midland Reporter in October. And it, it just shows how drastically the popular view had changed. It said of Redmond, um, he has been found out as a political humbug and an imposter who was willing to carve up Ireland and sell our northern province in exchange for a Dublin Castle bribe for himself and his lackeys. Ireland has no further business with a leader of that type. So the, the, the results were evident in the following year, 1917. The Irish party lost four by-elections in a row. The Sinn Féin movement was suddenly emerging, suddenly burgeoning. Catholic, the Roman Catholic hierarchy joined in the anti-partition campaign. They gave it a quasi-theological or religious character, the territorial integrity of the nation. Um, Redmond tried to backtrack then on partition. He said he would have no more to do with such proposals, but there was to be no forgiveness for his mortal sin against what had become a, a, a national taboo. From then on, from that point on, Nationalist Ireland told itself that self-government with partition was effectively self-government withheld. Uh, the constitutional movement was judged to have failed, and this, this new position was a, was a judgment that could only lead to, to impasse and armed confrontation. But the fact is that self-government was not withheld. In 1917, Lloyd George again offered immediate home rule if the nationalists would accept the principle of partition. The offer was refused. The concept of self-government withheld formed the basis of Sinn Féin's 1918 election campaign and its appeal to the Versailles Peace Conference under the slogan of the freedom of small nations. The, uh, the general election of 1918 then turned, uh, turned out a result with Sinn Féin getting 47% of the All-Ireland vote to the Irish party's 22%. But the Sinn Féin virtually ignored the partition issue and concentrated on Anglophobia in that election campaign. And again, later in the treaty debates of 1922, both sides ignored partition, even though by then it was a fait accompli. It was easier to consign it to the realm of rhetorical uh, pieties and to find a national scapegoat on whom to blame it. Redmond fitted that role perfectly, national scapegoat. Now the, the arc of his career is extraordinarily tragic. <clears throat> Uh, here was a man who, walk, uh, when he walked the streets of Dublin in the 1890s, he was hailed as a hero for his loyalty to the fallen Parnell. And some two decades later, he was uh, booed by hostile youths on the same streets. And not long afterwards, following a splendid funeral at Westminster Cathedral, um, when his body arrived at uh, Dunleary, his family feared uh, disturbances in Dublin. They felt it wiser not to bring his remains through the city, but to send them directly to Wexford for burial by train, to send them by train to Wexford for burial. The, the, <clears throat> the tragedy for Ireland, of course, was, was much bigger than Redmond's personal tragedy. Something like his 1914 nightmare did materialize. If we take the three violent conflicts between January 1919 and April 1923, which were in effect three separate civil or intercommunal conflicts that left, uh, that left about 6,000 people dead, and that uh, spread over 51 months. That was a killing intensity that equaled almost 12 times 
that of the recent Northern Ireland Troubles. And it also caused the loss to emigration of the skills and wealth of a large part of the Southern Unionist community. The uh, Redmond's last biographer, Dennis Gwynne, took the view that partition was an evil that could have been avoided if British governments had only, quote, stood up to, as the saying goes, the Ulster Unionists. In his, in his view, Redmond needed to be excused for his acceptance of partition and for the fact that it ultimately came about in a permanent form. And so out of this came the narrative that Redmond was let down or betrayed by British leaders he had trusted. But uh, I, I really didn't find any evidence for this. Um, I, I think you'll find that if anybody was, lead, was uh, dominating anybody, certainly in 1910, between 1910 and 1912, it was Redmond exerting his will over British politicians, not the other way around. Um, it took us many, uh, it took us, I mean the Irish nationalist community, many decades to tell ourselves the truth about partition and to appreciate that it did not originate in London, but in the, two, in the need for the two communities on this island to accommodate each other's different national identities. <coughs> uh, many things look different now as we enter the centenary of 1914. The sovereignty over which so many agonized a century ago has been for some years now effectively in the hands of the country that peers on the steps of the GPO called our gallant allies in Europe. Many of us seem not over happy about that. <laughs> uh, something else looks different now. Redmond never formally accepted a principle of consent in regard to Ulster Unionism. But those of us who value the constitutional tradition and who take the view that violence gained little for Ireland that could not have been gained by other means will agree that his pragmatic willingness to override his own deep convictions in order to avoid bloodshed between Ireland's two national communities has been vindicated by history. And I mean by this, in, in, 19, in 1998, this community of ours, by referendum, agreed to recast our constitutional territorial claim over Northern Ireland to an aspiration and formally accepted the principle of consent. In doing that, I would suggest we were finally catching up with our lost leader. Uh, now, I'd just like to thank um, very many people here. Uh, I want to first of all thank Mary Green and John Green, the great grandchildren of John Redmond, for coming here from London for this launch and for their generosity in giving me access to the Redmond family papers and memorabilia. Uh, they gave me some of the photographs that appear in this book. Some of the images in this book are uh, family photographs which they gave me. Um, I'm also grateful to Peter Leppard who's come here from Bristol. Uh, uh, he's here tonight. He generously made available to me his transcription of the visitor's book that Redmond kept at his home in Okavana in County Wicklow. <coughs> it gives a detailed list of the constant stream of uh, people who visited Redmond. Down there, right in the heart of the Wicklow Mountains. <coughs> And I, I can't thank enough Lisa Hyde and Conor Graham of Irish Academic Press for the magnificent job they have done with this book. It's less than a year since I got in touch with them. Um, it's one thing to write a manuscript, but it's quite another thing to turn it into a handsome book. I'm, I have to say that I'm, I'm thrilled with the quality of the cover design and the images inside. And I think it was an inspired suggestion of Lisa's to put the John Lowry portrait. Uh, I had a different idea for the cover, but I'm sure glad that uh, I accepted hers, <coughs> her suggestion. Thanks to all the supportive friends and colleagues who've come here tonight, including my former teaching colleagues from St. Michael's Secondary School in Vignes, and to everyone else who helped me with the research, I'm grateful. Lastly, I want to thank my mother who's here tonight, and my partner Dara for their support and encouragement and patience. Sadly, none of my four kids could be here tonight. Uh, so I'll just have to arrange a couple of relaunches <laughs> in far flung places like Ho Chi Minh City, Morocco, and Amsterdam. We'll work that out later. Thank you very much.